So the General Conference in the North American Division sets aside one day a year for Women's Ministry Emphasis Day. And that day happens to fall in July during camp meeting in Arizona. So we move things around a bit until now. And that's why the offering today was not for Women's Ministry. That was a couple months ago when we were supposed to have Women's Ministry Day. The sermon that I'm going to be presenting today was written by the Inter-European Division Women's Ministry Leader. Her name is Denise, Denise Hochstrasser, and her assistant, Hanalee Otschowski. And Hanalee does a daily devotional on the Hope Channel, Ukraine and Germany. I thought that was really interesting. I would probably be more comfortable presenting a sermon that I designed myself. It's easier to present your own thoughts than somebody else's. But as I read through this in preparation, I was blessed. And I hope you will be too. Please bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask your special presence here today with us. You have given these words to the women who wrote this sermon. Please pass that message on through me to these listeners. Please don't let me get in the way. Thank you. In your name, amen. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Jesus' words should cause us to lift up our heads, realizing what a glorious thing it is to be a Christian. For you were once darkness, but now you are children in the Lord. Walk as children of light. We have not only received light, we have been made light. We have become transmitters of light. Most of us have no idea what complete darkness is like because we have lights we can turn on. Now my kids like to go caving with Jeff Stevens so they know what complete darkness is and I don't think I would be very comfortable there, thank you. <laughs> Those of us who live in cities have street lights, our homes have lights, we have flashlights to walk at night, our vehicles have headlights, and often we enjoy the beautiful moonlight. But when one is completely without light, it is difficult to function. We need light to find our way in the dark in order to avoid harm. How could we find our way home in complete darkness? We couldn't even find the place to put our key in the door. Darkness can also be a symbol for sin. Bad things often happen under the cover of darkness. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 11, and 12, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. We are called to turn away from darkness and to look towards good and positive things. We read in Philippians 4, 8, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. I know we're all very familiar with this text. And I was pondering this text. But Lord, this is in bad, evil world. Bad things happen. Even with good people, bad things happen. Even from good people, bad things happen. And I was pondering a bad thing. Something something I became aware of, something that could hurt somebody I cared about. And I was really fretting about this. Imagine that, me fretting. And I was preparing for this sermon, and I came to this text. And I thought, well, Lord, how can I look at what's good in this little situation here? And so I stopped and I said, okay, well, rather than pondering and focusing on the bad thing that could happen, look at a positive thing from that same situation. And the person I was worried about actually reacted beautifully to the situation. So I decided to focus on that instead, and it completely changed my attitude towards the whole situation. So maybe that's what this text, at least that's what this text hints to me, is look for the good in a situation. It, you're gonna have bad things. Look for the good. At the same time, I was reading one of my farming magazines, of all things, and I came across a great article about a woman who said, I choose to be happy. And she talked about all these terrible things that happened in her life. And in each case, she said, here's this awful example, but I chose to look at it this way. 
this terrible thing happened to me, but because that happened, this didn't happen. And she found positives in every single situation. And she said, I am happy because I have decided I'm going to be happy. I'm going to look at the positive. Now, it didn't say she was a Christian, but it seems to me she was really following the intent of this text. We are to turn from darkness to its opposite light. Let's consider some other opposites, good and bad, sun and shade, light and darkness. We need light to dispel darkness, to help us see hidden dangers, both physical and spiritual. Consider another pair of opposites, land and sea. They are opposites, but they're closely linked. Where the land ends, the sea begins. Whether you call it Land's End or Finisterra, Finisterra, Cape of Good Hope or Cape Horn, these stormy coasts pose a great danger for seafarers. Many ships have sunk there in storms, and many men have lost their lives. That is why lighthouses were built on the most dangerous coastal areas to warn of the lurking dangers. We don't know very much about the origin of the first lighthouses, but centuries before the time of Jesus, the Eastern Mediterranean was already buzzing with maritime commerce, and they must have used some kind of lights to help the vessels find their way home to harbor. Early attempts to signal the way home probably were very simple, torches or campfires along the way to show the fishermen the way in. Today there are still many lighthouses. They are built in important shipping lanes or on dangerous coasts. Their lights help ships avoid dangerous shoals, rocks, and sandbars. Think about those seafarers in the past who saw a lighthouse in stormy weather and were guided safely to port. How happy they must have been to see the beams from those lighthouses. Not only do they have a way guiding them in, but they know they're almost home. There is a song about an old lighthouse, which goes like this. There's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life's sea. When I'm tossed, it sends out a light that I may see, and the light that shines in darkness now will safely lead us o'er. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, my ship would be no more. Everyone that lives about us says, tear that lighthouse down. The big ships don't sail this way, why have it around? Then my mind goes back to that stormy night when I could see the light. Yes, the light from that old lighthouse that stands up on the hill. And I thank God for the lighthouse, I owe my life to him. For Jesus is the lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin, he has shown a light around me that I could clearly see. If it weren't for the lighthouse, where would this ship be? We all need spiritual lighthouses to help us avoid harm. We must be able to calculate our position, navigate a safe course. Many people today consider faith in God a thing of the past, something we moderns no longer need. They depend on other navigation systems and orient their lives with the help of other various religions or philosophies like humanism or atheism. However, the old lighthouses still stand on the rocks where they were built hundreds of years ago, just as God's word stands like an unfailing lighthouse. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This lighthouse, Jesus, shows us the way to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We can't be safe without Jesus, our lighthouse. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, 12. <coughs> Jesus is the light that shows us the way to God. He also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have this light to guide us to the Father. In the book Gospel Workers, Ellen White says, We who are living in this age have greater light and privileges than were given to Abraham, Joseph, Moses, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and other ancient worthies. And we are an under correspondingly greater obligation to let our light shine to the world. Not only are we to follow this light ourselves, we are also to show others how to find this way as well. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13 through 16, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We can be lights for others, as we sing in the little song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm going to let it shine. Perhaps we don't feel as though we are major lights. That is not required. Even if our light is very small, if we let it shine in our lives, we are fulfilling the mission Christ entrusted to us. So, are we lights? Are we letting our light shine? Or does our presence extinguish somebody else's lights? Where does our light come from? The light shines in the darkness. That is why we should live in the light and be light. Jesus gave us a mission. We are to let our light shine. Are we living in the light each day, living so close to our Lord that his light, his love, shines through us? A group of tourists visited a majestic old cathedral. They saw the beautiful stained glass windows through which the church, through which the light shone into the dark church. A child asked the tour guide, what kind of people are those in the windows? The guide replied, they are the saints, holy people. That evening, the child told his mother, Now I know who the saints are. They are people who let the light shine through them. This child's words are a wonderful reminder that we are all to let the light shine through us. Another illustration is the story of a king who had three sons. In order to find out which one would be his successor, he gave them a test. They each had the same assignment. They must fill the great castle hall. The first son was very diligent. He worked very hard. He fetched load after load of wood and stacked them in the great hall and filled it. It was a lot of work and he was sweating. At the end of the day, he was full of pride and he was finished and he showed his father the full castle hall. The next day it was the second son. The task for him was easy. He decided to fill the great castle hall with straw. It didn't take very long, it was pretty easy, and he had a big fork and he fluffed the straw up so it didn't take as much to fill it, and he said, that will do. The assignment is fulfilled, and he showed it to his, fa to his father. The third son's day came, and he just waited. He had time. Puzzled, the brothers asked him, well, why don't you start? The hall has to be filled. Evening came, and it became dark, and he took a candle and put it in the middle of the hall and, it, and lit it. Lo and behold, the hall was filled with light. The light drove away the darkness. There was nothing to be added. The father was so impressed with his wisdom that he said, you will inherit the kingdom. Do we, each of us, want to inherit the kingdom? Really? Then let us shine. We can be a warm, bright light in the darkness of this world. We do not need to be great, beautiful, elegant, perfect. We do not need to possess many talents. We do not have to have studied theology at the seminary. It is enough to be a little light as long as we shine. As we consider our Lord's words that we are to be lights, let us learn from the moon. The moon does not shine by itself. It can't, even if it wanted to. It merely reflects light from the sun. If the moon wanted to shine by itself, that would be impossible. But if the sun shines on it, the moon reflects that light beautifully. We can also be faithful lights as we fellowship with other believers. We strengthen. We can strengthen each other, sharing the wonderful light of the gospel and encouraging one another. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.19, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household. We are fellow citizens and members of God's household. The Apostle Peter confirms this with the words, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. 1 Peter 2, 9. We are called into his light. We are part of the holy nation. So we are also saints, devoted to God, called into his light. What a wonderful image. 
We must let God's light shine through us like the saints in the stained glass windows of the cathedral. We cannot shine of ourselves. We should turn towards God's light and let him fill us with his love. Thus we will shine. Do you love Jesus? Do you live with Jesus? Have you made him the number one priority in your life? If so, you are a disciple of Jesus. Have you accepted the salvation offered by Jesus? Then you are holy. Holy in the sense of being set aside or devoted for a special purpose. You are chosen of God to reflect his love, to shine. The early Christians called themselves saints because they were disciples of Christ. They had devoted their lives to him. They permitted God to shine through them so that his light would make it obvious that they were Christians. How did others see that? The people were so impressed by the first Christians that they said, look how they love one another. Christ's followers were recognized by their love. God's love shone through them like the light of the sun through the windows of the stained glass, through the saints of the stained glass window. One of the early saints of the early Christian church is Lu Saint Lucia of Syracuse. Born around 283 AD in Syracuse, Sicily, she became a Christian at an early age. She decided to devote her entire life to Jesus. We are told that she spent her life lovingly caring for the poor, and her name Lucia means the shining one, from the Latin word lux, meaning light. According to available sources, Lucia was the daughter of a rich Roman citizen of Syracuse who had died young. Her mother, Eutychia, wanted to marry her off, but Lucia had sworn to stay a virgin for Christ's sake and put off the engagement. When her mother was healed of a disease during a pilgrimage, Lutikia agreed to honor Lucia's vow. But the betrothed was another matter. He accused her of being a Christian in the persecution of Diocletian. She was condemned to death and was killed by the sword. December 13, 304 AD is said to be the date of her death. An inscription on a grave around 400 in the catacombs of San Giovanni in Syracuse and her mention in lists of martyrs are all proof that she did live. In Sweden, people commemorate her life on St. Lucia Day, December 13, with a traditional ceremony. In the darkness of the early morning, a girl representing Lucia, wearing a white robe, a red sash, and a lighted crown of candles on her head, passes through the dark streets. She's accompanied by other girls, also dressed in white robes and carrying <laughs> burning candles, who follow her and sing the Lucia song. The candles shine in the darkness in the early morning, and everyone enjoys a special holiday. But hardly anybody thinks of the spiritual significance of St. Lucia Day, even though they know the story. In a similar way, the love of Christ shines in the darkness of this world, and many people don't recognize it. Jesus is the light of the world. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John 1, 4, and 5. Even in his day, the people didn't understand it. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8, 12. Jesus has brought light into this world, and it shines even today. He wants us to walk in his light and come to him with our sorrows and burdens in order to live in his glory. Today we need God's love more than ever. But unfortunately, we are often diverted from this light of the world. From this light, we're often diverted from God's light by the world. So many things in our hectic lives make it difficult for us to have a real relationship with our Lord and Savior. Often we do not make the time to let his light shine on us. As a result, it cannot shine through us. Jesus said both, I am the light of the world and you are the light of the world. Matthew 5.14 Thus he gave us a task. Like Lucia, who expressed Christ's love in deeds of charity, we should also be a light in this world. Even though we may only be small lights compared to God's great light, we should let our little light shine in our corner of the world in order to dispel the darkness. Jesus does not want us to cover up our light. He wants us to be a light that shines into the whole world. If every Christian lets his or her light shine, the world will be filled with light. The world needs the light of Christ's followers so that it will become bright for everyone.
even a small light can illuminate the way and prevent someone from stumbling and falling. Christ expects that men will become partakers of his divine nature while in this world, thus not only reflecting his glory to the praise of God, but illuminating the darkness of the world with the radiance of heaven. Thus will be fulfilled the words of Christ, you are the light of the world. This was from the book, Lift Him Up. One other thing I thought of as I was preparing the sermon, two weeks ago, the pastor's sermon was along this same topic. Last week, the pastor's lesson study was along the same topic. So I think the Holy Spirit must have a message for us along this line. If we as Christians live with God, our light will shine. We will reflect his love, his glory, his light. Just as the moon reflects the sun, we can shine only when we get let God's light shine on us. It is pleasant to enjoy the warmth and the light of the sun. It is just as pleasant and beneficial to enjoy God's presence. Our hearts are warmed and his light brightens our thoughts. We recognize that God is speaking to us, giving us new ideas and insights as to how we can carry his love to the world. As we spend time with our master, we will be filled with his love and will share it with all around us. Do we find saints, holy people, only in the windows of the cathedrals? Let us rather become the saints, the holy people who let his light shine through our lives. People will see that in our dealings, our actions, our radiance, our joy. Let us shine daily. Let us become saints who in ways both large and small share God's light in our world. Please bow your heads with me. Lord, we thank you for showing us the way to the Father. Help us to follow the light that shines on our path. Thank you for the salvation you offer us. Lord, thank you that you have given us the light of life. Let your light shine through us so that people who see us will see a reflection of your love and know that you are the light of the world. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 580, 580, This Little Light of Mine. Please stand.
Heavenly Father, please help us to be the lights you need, great or small. Help us to know that we can only do it if we are reflecting you and we are letting your light shine through us. Please use us in the way you need to and shine through us. In your name, amen.